a keynote address on chorioretinopathy and deep impact of ocular trauma. Yes. Thank you, Sanjit. sir. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I'll be speaking to you on chorioretinectomy for deep impact ocular trauma in Indian eyes. So the concept of chorioretinectomy is quite old. It was first done by Sivozinovic in 1987. But a prophylactic chorioretinectomy was first performed by Ferenc Kuhn in 2004. And this chorioretinectomy is done in deep impact ocular trauma with vitreous incarceration or choroid penetration. And it, it reduces the RPE proliferation, fibrous ingrowth and PVR from the wound site. It can be done as a prophylactic or a therapeutic procedure. So to understand the concept of chorioretinectomy, let us see this case. This was a patient of endophthalmitis, a double penetration wound with endophthalmitis. So we sutured the wound, we did a vitrectomy, and you see there was an exit wound in the, along the inferotemporal vein. Uh, so we decided not to touch, uh, touch this wound at this moment. And later on, postoperatively, the patient developed this severe uh, PVR and ERM over from this wound site. So again, we, uh, we had gone in and so we did uh, remove the ERM. We did a diathermy, this diathermy burns are 100% deep. So we did a deep 100% diathermy and then we uh, did the core, remove the retina and the underlying choroid using the diathermy and the vitectomy cutter. So after this, uh, the patient, sorry, did quite well. Uh, there was no recurrence of PVR or the epiretinal membrane formation uh, from the exit wound. Otherwise, you will keep, you will just keep on removing the ERM and again and again, the ERM will come back and give you a poorer vision. So this patient ultimately gained a vision of 6 by 18 uh, in this eye. So we did a small study to evaluate the success and limitations of performing pro prophylactic chorioretinectomy for deep impact ocular trauma in Indian eyes. It was a retrospective uh, case series. 11 eyes of penetrating eye injury with or without intraocular foreign body uh, were studied. The, the vitreous was incarcerated in poor posterior retina in all these eyes. The visual equity was more than PR accurate in all these eyes. Uh, either a 25 or a 27 gauge uh, vitrectomy with wide angle non-contact viewing system was done. The procedure involved the excision of the vitreous base, the removal of the foreign body if it was present, the chorioretinectomy followed by the endo laser and gas or silicon oil tamponade depending on patient to patient. The method was that deep 100% endo diathermy was done around the incarceration site. The, re the incarcerated re retinal tissue and the underlying choroid was removed till the level of the bare sclera. One to two rows of prophylactic laser around the site was done and any bleeding which was happening during the time of chorioretinectomy was controlled using the diathermy or increasing the infusion pressure. So results, uh, the demographics, they were all male patients. The average age was 28.3 plus minus 12 years. The intraocular foreign body inside the globe impacted in the posterior wall was seen in seven of these eyes. The exit wound was seen in, in two eyes. The knife, there was a patient with a knife injury in one eye with a vitreous incarceration posteriorly and there was a patient with cow's horn injury in, uh, in one eye. The associated retinal conditions were in seen in these patients. There was retinal detachment in four of these eyes and ophthalmitis in one. Significant vitreous hemorrhage in four, four of these eyes and subretinal hemorrhage in two eyes. And the surgical steps, uh, the silicone oil tamponade was used in five out of these eyes and gas tamponade in four eyes. Two eyes, we just used the ear tamponade. Postoperatively, retinal attachment was seen in all eyes. Recurrent PVR occurred in two eyes. The visual equity improvement occurred in almost uh, 10 out of 11 eyes. And there was a branch retinal vision, uh, vein occlusion affecting vision in one of these eyes. So this is a patient of intraocular foreign body which uh, was impacted into this uh, wound. And so the foreign body was removed. I, it just shows uh, the procedure, how we did that chorioretinectomy. You do 100% uh, deep diathermy burns around this impaction site, around this incarceration site. And then you just, uh, with the vitreous cutter or even with the, your diathermy also, you can melt the choroid. So you just remove the chor choroid and the overlying retina. Uh, with the vitrectomy cutter. You see there's small bleeding, but that can be controlled easily by raising the bottle height or by doing a diathermy at the bleeding site. The foreign body was then removed uh, through this scleral incision, which was later on sutured. 
then the fluid air exchange was done. Andolaser was done around this, uh, the area and gas was used as tamponade in this patient. So this was post-operative, the patient had a visual outcome, a good visual outcome, his vision post-operative was six by six. So another patient uh, of which I spoke of, there was a cause harm. There was a total vitreous hemorrhage with anterior incarceration of the vitreous, then retinal detachment with subretinal hemorrhage and posterior incarceration in this patient. And post-operatively, the patient regained a good vision of six by 18. You can see the retinectomy scar in the temporal periphery uh, of this patient. This was another patient of double perforation with the perforation in the macula, uh, sparing the fovea, and we did a retinectomy. This patient did very well. The vision improved to six by nine. Another patient of impacted intraocular foreign body. This was a patient of a supracoroidal intraocular foreign body with uh, fibrosis, and there was no other way to remove that foreign body except doing a retinectomy procedure. So we had to remove this uh, uh, choroid. This was a patient of, uh, who had an injury with a knife. He had a retinal detachment with vitreous hemorrhage with in incarceration. Then uh, uh, we had to do a retinectomy in this patient. So this is a small video uh, of the patient who had this hemorrhage chisel injury with intraocular foreign body. So this was the patient that I was speaking to you about the supracoroidal foreign body. You see this fibrous band was there. This was nasal to the disc. Uh, this was pulling up the retina. So we had to do a vitrectomy. Then we do, did base excision. We separated the fibrous band. And we created this retinectomy scar just nasal to this disc. And then we did a retinectomy here. And when we were looking for the foreign body, it was nowhere in the eye, but it was in that supracoroidal space here. Uh, you see, once we removed the choroid, then we found that there was this foreign body which was impacted here. And then this foreign body was again separated, removed, and uh, we'll just finish this off. So to conclude, choroidectomy is a relatively new procedure, but it may prevent exit site wound-related PVR and fibrous in growth over the retina from the wound site, and it may be considered as a prophylactic or a therapeutic op option. Thank you. Any questions? So the first presenter, Dr. Amar Pujari. Thank you. Respected judges and all my colleagues, I want to present my paper. That is evaluation of uh, anti-segment OCT versus ultrasound biomicroscopy in post-traumatic cataracts. I do not have any financial interest in any of the instruments. So why imaging is necessary in traumatic cataracts? Because the imaging shows something which is invisible on slit lamp or bare eyes, and it helps in optimal surgical planning, and it helps in more importantly patient counseling, what is what is the outcome. So this is a, some uh, in articles which I worked on OCT, where I have tried to enumerate the findings, what all we can get on VSOCT. Also, how to delineate the posterior capsule using OCT and how to de uh, detect the capsular defect on OCT. So with this uh, background ideas, uh, there was some uh, like things which are not clear. So what is lacking in the basic literature? A simple comparison between advanced ASOT, that is what shows ASOT versus UVM, which one is going to be better? And with Im each imaging, uh, uh, what all we can understand uh, with respect to interlenticular capsula and the perilenticular changes? And what are the advantages of ASOCT and what is the disadvantage of ASOCT as well what are the advantages and disadvantages of UVM. So with these intentions, my basic question is, can we compare the ASOCT versus UVM in post-traumatic cataracts? And if at all we can compare, what are the things we can get using ASOCT and what are the things we can get using UVM? So my aim is to compare the clinical efficacy of subsource antisegment OCC versus ultrasound biomicroscopy uh, UVM in post-traumatic cataracts. So I took ethical clearance committee clearance and it was a prospective recruitment and I recruited all the cases, me, Dr. Namrata and Dr. Kokar, all three operated the cases. I was an observer who did OCT for all 94 eyes and we had two SRs who did ultrasound biomicroscopy under respective concern, they converted the findings. So basically I did three degrees, 60 degree scanning, that means once you patient is able to see inside the machine or else he has low vision, just ask to gaze in the primary gaze. The machine takes 16 scans along each meridian and UBM, we are going to take one horizontal scan, one vertical scan, and one oblique scan at each point. So after this one, we have assessed what is the interlenticular findings, what are the posterior capsular details, which are quite important, and as well as perilenticular or retro iris details. So the mean age of 94 patients was 26 years, and 50 patients were male and 44 were female. And first finding.
understanding that the AS hospital was able to delineate the internal lenticular details with respect to fluid collection, the lamellar separation of the lens material, the size of the solar lens. The AS hospital and UPMA request, that means in all 100 eyes or 94%, sorry, 94 eyes or 100%, AS hospital and UPM were able to delineate the internal lenticular findings. Of course, there were some macro and micro differences were there, which I will show in images. With respect to posterior capsule details, the efficacy with AS hospital was around 95%, but it was 100% with UPM because UPM is able to penetrate better. But the clarity of the image with the UPM is quite inferior compared to AS hospital. Similarly, with respect to retro iris are the perilenticular details, which are quite important in traumatic cataracts. So, the uh, AS hospital was not able to penetrate the iris tissue. So, it did not reveal any perilenticular or retro iris details, whereas UPM was able to penetrate. So, this is one example you can see here. The intercapsule, subcapsular fluid collection, those are the intralenticular details which are quite clear, but perilenticular or the retro iris details are completely lack. So there you can see the decentration of the lens and zonular uh, dialysis, as are the interlenticular details as well as posterior capsular details. So this is example two, there is a herniation of the vitreous in the entry chamber along with the uh, luxation of the lens with the zonular rupture. There also you can see a very well delineation of the same along with retro iris details. Of course, we need to take one more scan which is going to be quite deeper than that one. And this is interlenticular details. You can see the fluid collection. You can see there is a reverse finding of the diaphragm. That means uh, the fluid has become hyperreflective. Other the capsular details, you can identify the interlenticular details. Again, in ASOST, you cannot identify the perilenticular retro iris detail. But in UBM, you can make out the entire thing. The lens has become globular there. So this is one video which I want to show. This is how 3 degrees actually scan is done. There you can see it is taking 16 scans. So here there is a posterior capsule rupture along with active herniation. You can see enter capsule, internal lenticular details, PC rupture, but you cannot see iris details. The advantage is you can take 16 scans along different meridian. But UBM at any given point of time can take only one scan, either vertical, horizontal or opposite scan. So what are the advantages of ASOST? It can scan the 360 degree of the lens with no contact and within few 5 to 10 seconds. The disadvantage is it is not able to scan the behind the iris or the perilenticular details. What are the advantages of UBM? It was able to scan the retro iris or the perilenticular details in addition to interlenticular as well as posterior capsular details. But what are the disadvantages? When you are scanning with UBM, you are able to take only one scan at any particular defined testing and it is contact pressure, which we don't want in traumatic cataracts. So to conclude, ASOST provides lenticular details on par with UBM in traumatic cataracts. Additionally, it provides interlenticular and liquefactive changes which are much superior to UBM. UBM has lesser magnification, but ASOST has better magnification. We can deal with it better. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from audience? If there are no questions, we'll call Dr. Shefa Habib. Thank you, sir. So we'll call the next speaker, Dr. Anupam Singh. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, myself, Dr. Anupam Singh. I am presenting the paper on the firecracker related in ocular injury, a retrospective study of the clinical outcomes in North India. Uh, we have no financial interest in this paper, starting with the introduction. The firework injuries are one of the major causes of the preventable blindness worldwide during the festive seasons. During the Deepavali and the other festive seasons in India, fireworks are freely available to use by the common people and the children leading to the increased incidence of the ocular trauma related to the fireworks. These injuries can cause irreparable, irreparable damage uh, to the ocular integrity which may also lead to the bl blindness. Firecracker related ocular injuries poses a significant risk to users as well as the bystanders. Uh, which may let them visually impaired for the rest of, rest of their life. The nature of the ocular injuries ranges from the abrasion to the complete, to complete loss of the perception of light. The aim of our study was to analyze the spectrum and to evaluate the clinical presentation after the firecracker injuries. The objective was to study the variance in the clinical presentation of the firecracker injuries in the eastern par part of the Uttar Pradesh. Now coming to the material and method, the source of our data were the clinical records of the, all the patients presenting in the emergency department of the tertiary care hospital in Uttar Pradesh the duration of the study was one year. 
it was a retrospective, uh, retrospective cross-sectional study and sample size was 155 eyes of the 150 patients. The patient underwent the in the, uh, an in-depth ocular examination, including the assessment of the visual acuity, slit lamp examination, intraocular, uh, measurement, intraocular pressure measurement, and fundus examinations. Bonioscopy, ultrasonography, B-scan, fundus photography, X-ray orbit, and CT scan orbit, and the skull were done whenever indicated. The injuries were classified according to the Birmingham Eye Trauma Terminology System. The patient was treated both as inpatient as and outpatient. Open globe injuries were admitted and treated on urgency basis. The inclusion criteria were the patient who presented in the emergency department with a firecracker injury, uh, firecracker related injury during the study duration. And the exclusion criteria were the patient unwilling to participate in the study and the patient with the grievous systemic injuries and warranting the urgent uh, multimodal medical at attention. Now coming to the my results, out of the 150 patients examined in the emergency care and the outpatient department during the one year period of time, 117 were male and 33 were females. The male to female ratio was 3.5 is to 1. Uh, now coming to the age distribution, uh, 31 patients belong to the age distribution of 0 to 10 years, 59 patients belong to the age distribution of 11 to 20 years, 22 patients belong to the age distribution of 21 to 30 years, and 20 patients belong to the age distribution of 31 to 40 years, 10 patients belong to the age distribution uh, of uh, age gap of 41 to 50 years, and 8 patients uh, to the 51 to 60 years. Uh, in 87 patients, the left eye was involvement, uh, involved, and in 58 patients, the right eye, uh, right eye was involved, uh, 10 patients presented with the involvement of the both eyes. Uh, in 60 patients, the visual activity as presentation was 20 by 40 or better. In 16 patients, it was uh, in between the 20 by 40 to 20 by 200. In 29 patients, it was 20 by 200 to uh, finger counting close to face. In 43 patients, it was hand movement to the per perception of light. And 7 patients were PL denied. Now coming to the uh, distribution of the eye trauma according to BETS classification, uh, 96 patients present with the contusion, 6 patients pre uh, presented with the lamellar laceration, uh, 33 patients presented with the superficial fallen body, uh, 8 patients presented with the penetrating trauma, 5 patients presented with the perforating trauma, 4 patients presented with the ruptured glue, and one patient uh, and 3 patients presented with the intraocular fallen body. Uh, coming to the primary surgical intervention, 8 patients underwent the co uh, corneal tear repair, uh, 3 patients underwent the surgical tear repair, 2 patients underwent the lensectomy, Three patients underwent the uh, past lunar vitectomy, and uh, 18 patients underwent the uh, secondary cataract surgery on the uh, next on the uh, other follow-ups. Uh, the visual activity was again assessed after the three months. Uh, 72, per, uh, 72 patients returned to the visual activity of 20, to, uh, 20 by 40 or better. 35 patients, uh, 35 patients presented with the visual activity of 20 by 40. Uh, 20 by 40 to 20 by 200. Nine patient with the visual equity less than 20 by 200 to finger counting close to face. 22 patient uh, to the visual equity of hand movement to the per perception of light. And 17 person, uh, 17 patient uh, uh, were presented with a PL denied. Uh, now coming to the types of the firecracker causing the injuries. Uh, in the 20, uh, 21 cases, sparklers were the firecracker which causes the injury. Uh, the most number of cases presented with the injury due to the bomb, which was 46 followed by the projectile uh, rockets, uh, which was 37 in number. Uh, the global incidence of the rate of the ocular trauma was estimated to be 3.5 to uh, 3.5 per 1 lakh persons per annum. Uh, during the, the festival season, we find the significant increase in the incident of the ocular injury due to the fireworks. And uh, visual impairment and disability are the financial burden on the family and the society. The out of the total 150 patients, 117 patients, that is the 78 percent were males and 33 patients, that is the 22 percent were females. The reason for the same may be attributed to the more outdoor activities of the male as compared to the female and their risk taking behavior. In our study, 90 patients of, uh, were of age less than 20 years which contributes significantly to the childhood blindness. Similarly, the 42 patients were in between the age group of 20 to 40 years which signified the more inclination of the young individual, individual getting predisposed to ocular trauma secondary to firecrackers. In our study, maximum 96 patients, that is the 62 percent, uh, 96 eyes, that is 62 percent, had the contusions and the 33 eyes, that is 21.4 percent, had the superficial fallen bodies. The injured eyes were irrigated with the pubis amount of the normal saline and the partic uh, particulate matter, shoot particles and the fallen bodies were removed with the forcep and the shrile, but under the local anesthesia. The pH was monitored before and after the ocular irrigation. The patients were prescribed antibiotic steroid uh, eye drops. Uh, the limitation of our present study was its retrospective nature and small sample size. Uh, to conclude, the lack of the uh, parental supervision, failure to maintain the safe distance from the firecrackers, 
and lighting side factors in the crowded area and exposing the passerby to the injury are very important factors that are responsible for the inadvertent ocular trauma that may be a life changing incident for an individual. Thank you, sir. These are basic. So, you mentioned one year study. Yes, sir. In a fire cracker, one year is not a sufficient yes, sir. because in our Indian, there may be two Diwali in one year sometimes. So, from your collecting data from which month? So uh, sir, we were collected data from the 1 October to, uh, 2020 uh, to the 31 September 2021, sir. So, in such cases, be careful because sometimes there may be one Diwali or sometimes there may be two Diwali, sometimes there may not be a any Diwali. Yes. But one big question from your study is just <coughs> you are getting 155 out of one. Yes, 150 sir. bilateral. That means yes, only five cases are bilateral. Yes, sir. Why? That because in our practice, maximum always bilateral, basically firecracker. But in you are mentioning, so out of 150 patients, only five patients are bilateral. Uh, what sir, is the reason? Sir, uh, we found that the more, most of the bilateral cases were children. And the, in the adult, uh, the cases were only unilateral, sir. Uh, we were not able to apprehend why this was there, sir. But as per the study literature and others, as per experience, whatever, always bilaterally be careful. Because the reason is maximum number, they are counting the only intraocular, intraorbital, or etc. If there is a leak, generally you overlook. In the skin, conjunctiva, you overlook. That's yes. the, maybe the reason, I think. Next speaker is Dr. Rohit Agrawal. Should I start? Yes, please. Good afternoon, everyone. My topic for presentation is a century gone in vain. It is a consecutive series of 100 ball related injuries. No financial disclosures. Uh, worldwide, there are roughly 1.6 million people blinded with, from ocular trauma every year and about 2.3 million people individually are, have bilateral low vision due to these injuries. Retinal detachments have been reported in about 9% of uh, contusion injuries can present many years post-trauma and require a long-term follow-up. Sports with a high-risk injury include cricket, hockey, uh, racket sports, handball, baseball, etc. Cricket is one of the most popular games in Indian subcontinent and injuries are reported both in professional and recreational matches. To a large extent, the game is played on streets and playgrounds uh, with no or minimal protection, uh, protective gear, leading to injuries of varying severity. Blunt force causes peripheral volume displacement to increased wedge pressure that causes damage to the area of uh, least resistance along the lens, iris root, and trabecular meshwork. Lens subluxation, retinal dialysis, and optic nerve avulsion uh, with vitreous hemorrhage are more severe complications. Blunt trauma by cricket ball can also cause counter coup injury uh, effect, leading to many vision impairing complications in the eye. The bro offers protection when the line uh, of approach is horizontal, but when the uh, ball approaches the eye laterally or inferiorly, the injuries are bound to happen. There are very few studies which have explored the vision threatening complications, need for surgical intervention, and final outcome after treatment from ball related injuries. The aim of the study is to report clinical features, visual outcome, management, and ocular complication of ball related ocular injuries. Material and method. It's a single center ret retrospective observational study the selection criteria for the study was history of ball related injury of cricket sport presenting between August 16 to July 19 with at least one follow up ranging from 1 month to 22 months. We analyzed case reports of 100 patients in whom all our study parameters have been recorded. Uh, th uh, those with a previous history of low vision or other ocular uh, disease of the trauma were excluded. Uh, results in our study 100 eyes of 100 patients all injuries secondary to the cricket ball related uh, and a majority of them were male, that is 92. There are seven patients who were less than 10 years of age with maximum number of them in the age group of 21 to 30 years. Most patients are classified as having contusion, this is 80 patients. 17 had a laminar uh, laceration, three patients had a globe rupture. The cases presented almost equally throughout the year with a small peak in mid-year and during December and lowest in the month of April. While injuries were sustained by different types of ball, the most common was tennis ball, followed by rubber and hard core balls. Nearly two-third of the patients had a uh, good corrected visual acuity of uh, 
more than 20 by 60 on the first visit. 19 had moderate vision and 14 had poor vision. The IOP on applanation was within normal range in 88, patient, uh, 88 uh, patients and raised in 12 of them in whom IOP ranged from 20 to 70 mmHg. Out of 37 patients who had undergone gonioscopy, 24 had angle dissection of various grades. Patients pre presented with various symptoms like pain, redness, diminution of vision and swelling. Lid edema was noted in 28, lid laceration in 6 and ecchymosis in 6. One patient had lid edema with pipeta. This is a picture showing upper lid laceration with orpillaris exposure. Enter chamber inflammation with cells was seen in uh, 69 uh, and 27 of them had varied severity of hyphema. In 26, there was iris sphincter tear with, uh, and two patients had a uh, sectoral iridolysis with a D-shaped pupil. There was a traumatic madriasis in 24 patients and one had RAPD. Three patients presented with visually insignificant lens changes. Two had a characteristic voucher swing and another three had phacodonosis. 18 patients had vitreous hemorrhages one, and one had a subhyaloid hemorrhage. Total 55 patients either had commercial retina with clear media, eight had regmatogenous RD, one patient had retinal dialysis without detachment and two patients had a traumatic macular hole, as you can see in the picture. Few patients presented with more than one findings at a time of assessment. The maximum finding which was seen was anterior segment anterior chamber inflammation and commercial retina. Medical intervention, 71 patients with anterior chamber reaction was, uh, were treated with topical steroids, of which two were on oral steroids for chronic retinal detachment with vitreitis and other patients had a traumatic optic neuropathy when he presented to us. Antibiotics, cycloplegics and antiglaucoma medications were also used for this patient. Uh, procedural management included vitrectomy for 5 patients, barrage laser for 2, corneal tear repair for 2, uh, trabeculectomy, irectomy and AC wash for 1 each and lid tear repair for 3 patients. This is a uh, photograph showing pre and post operative uh, for patients with retinal detachment and uh, PVR changes. This was another patient uh, who presented with vitreous hemorrhage and posterior pole rupture with commercial. This is pre and post surgery uh, photograph. This is photograph of a patient uh, who was done barrage laser for retinal dialysis. On final visit, a majority of patients had good visual acuity. 16 had moderate and one had poor vision. Of 14 who had poor vision at presentation, one had moderate vision and 12 had good vision on final visit, which was statistically significant. Discussion. Uh, ball related ocular injuries largely affect those in procedure uh, in productive age group, thereby leading to great impact on uh, impact socially and economically. The mean age of presentation in a study was 27.5 years and majority were males. One of the reasons for seasonal variation of injuries in India is uh, are, uh, the vacation is in mid-year and in December, hence the outdoor activities for youngsters is more. Whereas in April, which had lowest incidence, uh, the examinations of the schools and colleges is more during that time. Based on uh, BATS classification, most of our patients uh, were under category of contusion. 17% were laminal laceration and 3% had rupture. The presenting visual acuity was poor in 14% of the patients as against 54 to 78% from pre previous studies. Sadik et al. reported uh, that uh, retina uh, was most commonly involved. Uh, retina was most commonly involved uh, ocular structure. Uh, Aliman et al. found that hyphema was the most common. Uh, to conclude. Okay, just, uh, yes. <coughs> Surgical management procedure were needed in 15% of the patient in contrast to other studies where 60% required uh, surgical management. Conclusion this study was a descriptive report of 100 consecutive patients who presented with ball related injury. The drawbacks of the study were mechanism of injury could not be determined in all the cases as there was lack of long term follow up. While medical and surgical management can restore vision in most, uh, more emphasis is needed on pre uh, preventive aspects. Most eye and face injuries can be prevented if uh, proper uh, protect protective equipments are worn during the cricket match. These are my references. Thank you. Good study. In your maximum number of tennis ball injury, can you justify why? Sir, because uh, most of the matches which are played uh, in the, uh, the, the, the recreational matches, the uh, people do not use uh, protective gear, whereas in professional matches they always use protective gear. Good point. Yeah. Good stuff. That's the reason actually. Maximum time in ball after the course or in a by a good proper protection. So in your take home message you just highlight maximum that part. Okay. It, will, it will give me good information to the others. Okay. Thank you so much. <coughs> so next speaker is Dr. Sahil Agrawal. Dr. 
डॉक्टर साहिल अग्रवाल डॉक्टर सुचित्रा कुमारी बिस्वाल Good afternoon, one and all. I'll be presenting on sweat flow society finding in commercial retina. Commercial retina is a consequence of blunt trauma. Posterior pool involvement is termed as Berlin sedima, which is a misnomer. Histopathological studies have shown disruption of outer segment of photoreceptors and damage to RP. Few studies have noted that SD OCT shows hyperreflectivity of EZ and RP. In our preliminary observation, we found that cases with commercial retina. Showed hyperreflectivity of outer retina, which was not evident in swipe source OCT. The aim of our study was to describe the SS OCT features of commercial retina. It was a prospective observational study, and we have included patients who presented with globe globe injury, presenting within one day of injury with commercial retina involving the macula with clear medium. Color photo and OCT was performed with top gun DRA OCT. At presentation, at two and four weeks of follow-up, the findings and color photograph were correlated with OCT. The outer retinal deflectivity was assessed with uh, uh, by reducing the brightness of the scan to minus five on enhanced vitreous visualization mode. Here on the uh, left uh, uh, left hand side. Side, you can see the OCT image is taken in the normal mode, but the outer retinal deflectivity appears to be uniform. Whereas this, the OCT image, on decreasing the brightness, here we can make out the outer retinal deflectivity is decreased on the uh, right half of the OCT image. Uh, ten eyes of ten patients were included. All were ma males. Only four patients had uh, regular follow-up. The retinal discoloration was limited to parafoveal area in four eyes and uh, beyond parafoveal area in six eyes. On OCT, we found that a vertical band of hyperreflectivity spanning through the outer nuclear layer was seen in seven out of ten, ten eyes, and the band uh, was seen at fovea in all the seven cases. And there was no correlation with the retinal discoloration. It can be as uh, prominent as seen in case three, and it can be as subtle as seen in. Case four. It was associated with the uh, disruption of EZ in three cases, as shown here. A, a vertical band, uh, uh, band of hyperreflectivity is in extra foveal area in three eyes, and it was associated with hyperreflectivity of OPL and EZ disruption in the corresponding area. At four weeks of follow-up, this is the initial pre picture of presentation. Initial presentation OCT image showed the complete resolution of the vertical band of hyperreflectivity, and uh, the eyes which had pre-existing EZ loss at initial presentation had a defect at the follow-up. The area of retinal uh, discoloration corresponded to the hyperreflectivity of EZ and RP in five eyes. The hyperreflectivity area on the OCT, as denoted here by yellow dotted line, it corresponded to the area of discoloration on the color fundus image. There was no difference in reflectivity of EZ and RP one eye, as shown here. And in four eyes, the reflectivity of outer retina could not be assessed, as the commercial retina was limited to smaller area. At follow-up, we found that there was a vacuolar space development at EZ and IZ level at two weeks. Uh, this is the image at presentation, and here we can see the vacuolar uh, change at outer retina layer at two weeks. Coming to the discussion, the clinical presentation of commercial retina is transient retinal discoloration. Fundus image of commercial retina of posterior pole shows retinal whitening, sparing the fovea, giving the appearance of pseudo cherry red spot. It is believed that the disruption of outer segment of photoreceptor is responsible for retinal whitening, based on histological studies. Foveal findings were more obvious than extra foveal findings on OCT, in contrary to color fundus image. The retinal discoloration is definitely due to the change in photoreceptor layer, as shown 
by the presence of high fold reflectivity on OCT at presentation and development of vacuolar change at the level of EZ and IZ during follow-up. Though the photoreceptors are denser at fovea, the retinal discoloration is not seen at fovea. So it would be possible that the change in rod pigments are responsible for discoloration and fovea being devoid of rods may not exhibit discoloration. Retinal discoloration corresponds to hyperreflectivity of EZ on SDOCT, but in our study it corresponded to hyperreflectivity on SSOCT. This would probably due to higher wavelength of light used in SSOCT. The absorption spectrum of altered pigment in traumatized photoreceptor would be such that it reflects a lower wavelength light better than the higher wavelength, resulting in hyperreflectivity on SSOCT. To summarize, the OCT findings in commercial retina are lesser than color photo. And the SSOCT shows vertical band of hyperreflectivity in ONL, disruption of EZ and fovea, hyperreflectivity of EZ corresponding to retinal discoloration. Limitation being small sample size, poor follow-up, so the findings seen during follow-up could not be generalized. Most of the findings could be explained by watch list rather than certain evidence. These are my references and thanks. Uh, so as the, the patient presented in the, during, within the one day of the trauma, the visual equity, the best corrected visual equity could not be recorded. So we have taken, So the patient who had a complete resolution and follow-up, their visual equity was normal. But the patient who had an outer retinal defect, the visual equity was lesser. So. Uh, Whatever you're studying, this is it a baseline or visual equity should be whatever. It may be PL, it may be MM, heart movement, whatever that is. A, the primary component is a, that is a base of that our any study. Visual equity, without the visual equity, is impossible to do for any. We are going for higher, but this is a sum we can give lots of information, lots of that. Without that visual equity, is impossible for any study. Sure, so I'll try to For next close time that. onwards, and you are, of course, you are in a, some are you are highlighting that photoreceptor levels, etc. But that, this is very much essential for any study. Thank you, so sir. Actually, only judges can uh, ask the question. No questions are allowed from the audience. Okay. Yes, part time instruction. Okay, yes, part time instruction. He is okay. So his question will not to as your marking, mm -hmm. but our question only it will in that way. And of course, if you are select why you are mentioning your study is not associated, is not correlating with the other study. Can you justify it? Uh, so whatever previous studies were done with the SDOCTs, so the SDOCT wavelength was lesser than SSOCT. And uh, being a higher wavelength uh, in SSOCT, the findings are uh, different compared to the SDOCT. This is another important one. Second, another you mentioned in discussion slide one that your one of the limitation is Poor follow up. Yes, sir. So, may I know your that follow up still so in all big, cases? Uh, during the pandemic area, most of the patient did not turn up for the follow up. So, we had a less patient at the follow up. So, okay. But what is your as on that study? What is your proposed method or in methodology? What is the your target for follow up in such cases? Uh, we followed the patient at two weeks and four weeks. So as, as I mentioned, there was a vacuolar change in the outer retina, which no, we noted at two weeks. And four weeks, most of the findings resolved at four weeks. So even uh, I think the long-term follow-up is also required in post-trauma yes, cases. Time, so. Yes, In trauma, at least long time, that's why I'm asking. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. So the next speaker is Dr. Nabanita Barua. Dr. Nabanita Barua.
just uh, just a one announcement because your time limit try to finish your tenders or you can carry more months i'll try sir a uh, very good afternoon to respected judges today my uh, topic of presentation is management of wooden intra orbital foreign bodies a retrospective case series uh, introduction an object located within the foreign uh, within the bony orbit behind the orbital septum but outside the globe is known as a uh, intraorbital foreign bodies it can be of various type it can be metallic non metallic organic inorganic because of the precarious position it can cause a lot of injuries to the eye so we need to be very very careful about it and detection always remains very challenging because of the minor trivial trauma and a long forgotten history wooden foreign body it comes in the organic place it uh, specifically poses a special challenge because of uh, the problem with the detection as well as the management it is usually uh, symptomatic so we need to remove it it is often misdiagnosed on imaging like uh, ct scan and uh, during removal it may break off leading to various surgeries so it is a, a retrospective case series of consecutive 18 patients that were included over a period of uh, uh, from march 2018 to march 2021 um, they were all treated in uh, rio Uh, these are few of the cases that i am presenting first case is a one year old female patient presented with left eye pain and swelling for one week and there was a history of trauma two months prior she had already undergone two exploratory surgeries elsewhere before presenting to our uh, center a uh, patient was put on iv antibiotic we could not uh, get through the foreign body through the skin approach so we went ahead with the conjunctival approach um, post operative the patient resolved this is the second case of pain swelling of the This is a 20-year-old female patient, pain and swelling of the right eye, and there is a discharge from the injury site. On examination, we could see a linear wound that involved the upper eyelid and the eyebrow. <coughs> On MRI, we could see a abscess, wooden foreign body along with the abscess formation. Patient was put on IV antibiotic and right anteromedial orbitotomy was done, and there was multiple pieces. And lastly, this large piece came out. The This is the third case. A patient, patient, a 20-year-old male patient, presented with pain and foreign body of the right eye, and there's a history of trauma was five hours uh, ago. Uh, patient right eye was PL negative, and people were non-dilating. The site of impaction after this uh, on the emergency, the disintegrated foreign body was removed, but um, uh, the next CT scan showed the air pockets and avulsion or discontinuity of the optic nerve. but the symptomatology did not subside after when we we went ahead and did a mri uh, which showed a wooden foreign body located so we again had to after a conservative management of one week we had to again uh, go for a supramedial orbitotomy and post operatively the patient symptomatology uh, subsided this is the uh, uh, next case uh, the patient there is a wooden foreign body lodged in the inferior quadrant and there was also uh, vitreous hemorrhage present so after we removed Uh, and the laceration repair was done the patient was referred to vr surgeon for management this is another case which presented in the right side and after neuro uh, proper neuro imaging it was removed this uh, then this patient the, there is a traumatic ptosis of the th in uh, for 3 months uh, visual acuity was 6 by 6 on ct scan there was no foreign body that was seen but on mri we could see 1 cm foreign body that is present superiorly the patient was again um, put on oral antibiotics and it was removed through superior conjunctival approach uh, in our sample characteristic when to analyze we have seen the adult patients male patients uh, and there was a mild left eye predominance most of the cases were picked up on ct scan in the seven case it could there was a high suspicion and the ct could had missed it so we went ahead and did a mri <coughs> most of the patients improved with uh, single surgery but few patients we had to go for a second surgery because of the retained intraocular foreign body so uh, in all cases of uh, see, uh, uh, suspicious cases of retained intraocular foreign body we must go ahead and do a detailed history and examination all patients should receive an anti tetanus uh, prophylaxis empirical broad based antibiotics uh, covering the gram positive negative and anaerobic spectrum as well as antifungal if it is required it should be started in case of pus we should send uh, the patient for culture sensitivity microvagal evaluation should also be done in most of the cases of wooden foreign body we definitely need a surgical procedure because uh, it tends to imbibe more of water and secondary bacterial or fungal infection is very common it is very resistant to conservative management as seen by lv etl so most of the time we require a surgery uh, foreign body removal as a whole in itself is a challenging case because it tends to break off 
leading to requirement of the multiple surgeries. There is also, if it is there, uh, sometimes there is a vexing and waning uh, uh, episode is there. So in that, that case, we have an additional problem of tissue fibrosis. We also need to take care of that. Uh, there is a challenging situation uh, when the pa what imaging technique is to be uh, applied for what. CT scan, it is a very good modality of treatment. Most of the time it detects, although sometimes it, in case of small foreign bodies, it may... Try to reduce. sum up, your time is over. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in most of the situation, it may uh, be missed. In those cases, combined CT with MRI technique is of uh, importance. And uh, we need to take a proper history. Imaging with even, if it might require even the multiple, um, uh, multidisciplinary approach should also be taken as it may involve the antrum as well as the brain also. And timely diagnosis is of uh, utmost important in these cases. Thank you. So in, in your, as per your study, which one is more important, investigation or examination history? Sir, both. Uh, the problem is, uh, the problem with the wooden foreign body is that, uh, with many of the foreign bodies is that the, the trauma is so trivial that patient sometimes doesn't even remember. So we have to ask the patient, even if it is long back, like even one or two months, it might be very, very important. Because many of the time, as we are discussing this wooden foreign body, but as such metallic foreign body, they are quite lot tolerated. They can, patient might forget that, it, 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 it might there be somewhere. And the problem with the wooden foreign body is specific, like it can have a, uh, a lot of vexing warning episodes. Sometimes there is a, sometimes of inflammation is there, then the patient is quiet for again. Then like we had a one patient who had a present with fistula and we had a long history. So this is important and uh, we have to ask what kind of nature because many of the time uh, along with, we can have multiple involvement, multiple nature of the like ferromagnetic along with wooden foreign body, everything has to be there. And second, uh, second thing we have to know is sir, what kind of, uh, during the fall, what was the nature of uh, the which and uh, like supromedial quadrant is most important there. And one thing we would like to say that in case of investigation, we have to think like in case of CT scan, Mm, in all the literature we have seen, uh, uh, foreign bodies, uh, wooden foreign bodies specifically, they are very quite often missed on CT scan because first yeah, of you all, mentioned, very small. Already you mentioned that yes, you know, and it is already well established. Yeah. MRI is best. MRI is the da investigation. Yes, and T1 gate. Uh, I, I want to know this yeah. time is almost we are you know, running behind. So why MRI is better over CT? Yes, sir. First of, uh, first of all, if it is a very small thing, it can be missed on MRI because it ca it can mimic air uh, in CT scan. Yes. Second, second, uh, it the CT finding of the wooden foreign body it keeps on changing. Like sir, uh, it is literally li literally um, in weeks there is an inflammatory tissue that fibrosis is there. It can, but as the time increases, there would be fat enhancement also. So the um, uh, marking the borders are m now much less defined, so the diagnosis is better. And if it is one month, there would be ca even calcification along with this. So the nature, it, it uh, the uh, changes that are there, it changes. Calcification, now, now, of course, if that is very rare, calcification, mm -hmm. that the CT is better. Yeah. But soft tissue delineation, so, uh, sir, yeah. your answer should be soft tissue delineation, it is and the characteristics of the things. Yeah. Once you can exclude it, the metallic foreign body, of course, the investigation is should be, MRI. Should be MRI. Bec and especially the T1 uh, catered images are better because we can also go for contrast changes and fat, fat, especially fat suppression techniques, which will help us to differentiate between the nature of the foreign body and surrounding stock tissue inflammation can also be suppressed and uh, we can uh, enhance the foreign body, the location and the extent. Next speaker is Dr. Mehul Shah. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon. So I'm going to talk about the model of predictive model for visual outcome, in particularly pediatric patient in very young pediatric patient it is important to uh, know about the ocular trauma as well as in pediatric age group because visual outcome is not predictable like other because of, because of comorbidity. We know that social and economical impact and there are a lot of uh, financial and social loss 
these are important uh, challenges in the children, particularly comorbidity and most important is amblyopia. So which are the predictive models available in the literature? One is ocular trauma score described by Kuhn et al. And another is classification and regression tree CRT analysis. These are designed in long back in 2004, but were not valid validated with the larger database. We investigated and we validated this both one is published in ophthalmology and second in JCRS. So PERTI OTS uh, was uh, validated in ocular trauma in pediatric cases. Uh, but because of shortcomings, the pediatric ocular trauma score was developed and we published that in Graphe Archives of Ophthalmology considering the special aspects of the pediatric age group. And these were all discussed in this uh, review article. So why toddler ocular trauma score? In case of toddler zero to six year, visual assessment on presentation may not be possible. And uh, toddler ocular trauma score was designed by Reed et al, but they considered zero to 18 years of age and on, uh, considered only on open globe injury. So we, uh, we have tried to study this newer modality of prediction um, all uh, this is a prospective cohort study and all cases less than six months follow up were excluded. The OTS categories were from one to five or, and POTS from one to five, so more severe to less severe. In case of toddler ocular trauma score, it was a five to one, so again more severe to less severe. And R ROC curves and area under ROC curves were analyzed comparing TOTS with OTS and POTS for all categories to know the specificity and sen sensitivity. To perform the statistical analysis, POTS and OTS were categorized in two to five, well merged into low risk category and high risk category. So this is how we calculated the score calculation. This is basic described by Kuhn et al. So by row score and uh, deduction within particular conditions. These are the modifications done in pediatric ocular trauma score where these are these two factors are included one is the age and second is the wound location the age and zone were included and uh, these are the score calculation for toddler ocular trauma score where pre presenting acuity is not important but clinical findings were important where wound more than seven, six millimeter size hyphema lens damage corridor detachment and retinal detachment some of the uh, score less than one considered was a good prognosis. The results, uh, we did the 1630 cases out of which 681 were the pediatric cases, zero to 18. And we studied 124 cases under year, uh, age of six years. So these are the age sex wise distribution and 25% almost were the open globe injury. The results mean age was 4.6 years Pre and post visual acuity, uh, visual, pre and post uh, treatment dif uh, were significantly different. There is no significant difference between open and closed globe injury and children aged un under two years had poor prognosis. These are the comparative study in uh, of OTS and pediatric ocular trauma score. Uh, percentages of actu predicted and actual visual outcome. And uh, the second table is having ROC area under ROC curve. So these are receive, receivers operating characteristic area uh, curves, area under which was calculated and this slide shows for the poor prognosis category, we see that it is not significant. While here, uh, better prognosis, we can see the area is larger and uh, having better prognosis. These are the comparative study of uh, various uh, variables, particularly with uh, TOTS, with ocular trauma score and pediatric ocular trauma score. We, we could see that we did not find any significant difference in other than OTS2. This is the comparative summary, the ocular trauma score and pe uh, pediatric ocular trauma score basically based on presenting visual acuity while total ocular trauma score is presented with, with the clinical findings. And uh, here uh, it is uh, from zero to five, zero to five, are uh, more severe to less severe condition in uh, total ocular trauma score, five to zero, more severe to less severe condition. In conclusion, this is a novel predictive score is more reliable than uh, pediatric ocular trauma score and less specific and sensitive in high risk cases. The TOTS can be employed to examine the outcome in toddler in whom vision checkup is not possible at presentation. Thank you. Well studied, very innovative.
are you apply any method for you to correlate your clinical judgment to correlate your clinical assessment uh, your i think uh, this these guidelines we have taken from uh, article by reed et al which was published in japos so we have taken those things but we made modification in age group as well as uh, type of injury they studied only for open globe injury for 0 to 18 years of age we tried to implement that in 0 to 6 years of age because between 10 to 18 it is possible to examine the vision and presentation which is which might not become possible for 0 to 6 years Okay, because Amblope is one of the big challenges for that, us. That is more important. Any take him message to the audience to overcome Amblope? Any trauma cases, <laughs> the prognostication has to be done and uh, parents can be explained in for all pediatric patients what child will regain the vision. For that, any of the convenient me methodology should be employed. All, anyone. Next speaker is Dr. Marian Pauli. Uh, good afternoon, dear judges. My paper is on delayed management of unsutured canalicular tear and all new surgical technique. Uh, no financial disclosure. As we know, canalicular lacerations constitute 16% of all island lacerations. It can be either due to penetrating or blunt trauma. The timing and the surgical uh, technique has been uh, in evolution. There are different studies on different timings and the different surgical techniques. Uh, six hours is the optimum time to repair a fresh canalicular tear. Up to 14 days also has been described. So this is a retrospective interventional case analysis of two patients diagnosed between April 2020 to December 2020 in a tertiary care center in South India. Surgical technique and outcome were described. So this is my first case. He is a 27-year-old male presented to us six months following road traffic accident. Already had undergone lane laceration repair elsewhere. On examination, tear film white height was high, rope loss was negative. You can see a scar extending from uh, upper lid to lower lid. Uh, involving the can can canalicular area. Uh, syringing was done. It confirmed a block 4 mm from the punctum involving both upper and lower canaliculi. The patient was very symptomatic and he is very young. So uh, we did a wedge resection involving the scar. The distal canaliculus was identified. Syringing was done to assess the patency and the wound closed with minimonoca in layers. The stent was removed at six weeks. Fluorescein dye disappearance and syringing was done. It was patent and the patient is symptom free at one year follow. This is his post-operative picture where the tear film height is normal. Coming to the case two, a 31 year old male presented to us uh, three months following road traffic accident. Already had undergone repair elsewhere. On examination, he has got a lead notch in the left eye and uh, involving the lower eyelid. On syringing, through the upper punctum, it was patent through the upper punctum, but there was a block at the four, 6 mm from the punctum in the lower canaliculus. CT scan showed a fracture maxilla, which is evident from the facial flattening in the left eye. He also underwent the same procedure. This is a short video. Sorry. So the scar was excised in a wedge shaped fa fashion. Mini monarcha inserted after identifying the distal end. Pericanalicular sutures were taken with a 6 0 vicryl. Lid margin and skin were closed with in a routine fashion. So this is his post operative picture at the three months follow up. Uh, he is also asymptomatic with fluorescein is draining as well as syringing is patent. So coming to the discussion, secondary repair of unsutured canalicular tear is a source of controversy because it has got an unpredictable disease course. Sometimes the distal canaliculus can get scarred. If the patient is asymptomatic, we can try conservative management. Trifination has been described in canalicular blocks, but it is the success rate is uh, around 50% because it's a blind procedure. 
If the patient is symptomatic, botulinum toxin can be given to the lacrima gland. Again, it is unpredictable and uh, temporary. Finally, conjunctiva dactrocystor rhinostomy is an option, but it has lots of lifestyle modifications and variable success rate. Uh, what the literature says, to et al. in 2017, American Journal of Ophthalmology, what they have done is when the canalicular repair is secondary, uh, priority to head, thoracic, or abdominal injuries, a delayed repair can still be successful. The word they have used is still be successful if it is performed by an experienced surgeon. So basically, they look at the surgeon's competency. So what's the current understanding? Timing, more or less, within six hours, you have to do to get a good outcome. Uh, delayed repairs are very, literature is very sparse. Technique, again, not clearly described. Outcome is also very much variable. So our technique, that is a virgin resection, is a traditional technique described in lid procedures for lid tumors, lid notch with the localized trichiasis and lid colobomas, and it's a very simple and versatile technique. So the normality of our technique is the scar is excised like a wedge. Uh, in 2017, a study from China shows uh, cut open the scar and uh, uh, try it for the patency. But in that paper, the patency was around only 80%. And after excising the wedge, look at the distal canaliculus and then uh, suture in layers like a routine wedge resection. So what the study adds, uh, wedge resection is a novel technique in the secondary repair of canalicular tears and it highlights the judicious use and careful selection of minor surgical procedures in the management of canalicular obstructions due to mechanical trauma. These are my references. Uh, thank you. So you mentioned it will need the experience and of course you can. But for your others, can you tell if it is a nearer to that, your curtain is nearer, mm -hmm. is it possible to distract? Sometimes a little difficult if it is very close to the uh, distal canalic. Uh, if very close to the punctum, what we have done is we can make a new punctum. Yes. Uh, and uh, put a minimum. Do, we want to know what audience, what are your techniques to create a new punctum? Yes. What techniques you would adopt in to create? If punctum? the scar is through the punctum, we can excise the punctum and then put mini, mono mini monoca stent and then do a peri uh, tubal suturing. So that once the tube is removed, uh, the punctum will be open. Second, you can inject mitomycin C into the peri, peri tubal area so that it will not have any scarring. Last speaker of the session is Dr. K. S. Kumar. Okay. Uh, respected judges and uh, the audience. Uh, I am Dr. K.S. Kumar and I am in solo practice. I don't have a series of cases. Instead, I have a very instructive case. Uh, I don't have any financial disclosures to make. The subject of my presentation is a 10-year-old boy who presented with a history of blunt trauma to the right eye with a tennis ball uh, way back in 2008. He was treated for traumatic uh, uveitis and later he underwent a transconjunctival cryo for an inferior nasal dialysis without detachment. But he was noted to have persistent hypotony and disc edema with hypotonic maculopathy in the right eye. An ultrasound biomicroscopy was done elsewhere. No celiocoroidal detachment was seen and there was also no evidence of cyclodialysis cleft as reported by the people who did the uh, UBM. So the patient was put on intensive prednisolone acetate suspension eye drops as well as atropine eye drops twice a day for the next four to six weeks. Uh, Periocular steroids in the form of triamcinolone acetonide was also given in February 2008 with no improvement in his uh, intraocular pressure. The pressures continued to remain low and hypotonic maculopathy persisted for almost now two months. Repeat UBM was not contributory and there was no evidence of any anterior chamber inflammation. So the question, uh, this was the optic disc picture showing a, a disc edema and hypotonic maculopathy. The question was what to do at this stage. So we were really at our wit's ends uh, so we decided to go ahead and do an encyclage with a 240 silicon band, which, is, which has a width of 2.5 mm. The anterior margin was placed right behind the recti insertions. 
after an intraoperative gonioscopy was done to fill the AC with viscoelastics and pilocarpine to see if there was any uh, uh, cyclodialysis cleft, but we couldn't make out any intraoperatively. Another thing that we decided to do was to excise the steroid lump in the optimistic hope that the intraocular pressure will build up and the steroid lump should not cause uh, increased IOP. So this was a, this is a diagrammatic representation of what we did. We did we put a mattress suture in each quadrant and then did a band tie in one of the quadrants. Post procedure, the intraocular pressure improved to 14 millimeters mercury with resolution of fundus signs. These are the sequential photos of the fundus showing normalization of the retinal uh, architecture. So post traumatic hypotony can be due to a cyclodialysis cleft or a celiocoroidal detachment or uveitis. Atropine has been tried as a first line management as a conservative method for up to nearly two months. The other things described are cryotherapy to the area of the cleft, intravitreal gas, vitrectomy, plombage, which we did in our case, and there is a case report of a CTR ring being put in the sulcus as well. So two years later, the patient developed a cataract that was of course successfully managed with uh, cataract surgery and 14 years on the patient is doing very well. So in conclusion, an encircling belt buckle which is purely extraocular is a plausible option in refractory ocular hypotony, particularly in cases such as ours where we don't have a definite cause identified. So this acts more like a blanket treatment to occlude a possible cyclodialysis cleft. And more importantly, it avoids the need for any intraocular procedures. Thank you very much for your patient here. It is most probably a cyclodialysis cleft only if that could not be identified because uh, identification of a cyclodialysis cleft, particularly if it is just a pinpoint cleft, is very difficult in the presence of a hypotonus globe itself. So in the, in the collapse state, the cleft may not show up on an UBM. And again, the UBM is also, uh, sensitivity is dependent on the, U on the person yes, doing yes, it. Yes, I agree with you. So there excellent, are so many excellent, excellent case. But only disadvantage is only a single case. But we had, yes, yeah, yes, but yes. we had no other option in this case. As a last fine, throw of fine. the dice, we decided to do an encircling. Fine, fine, excellent. So we are already running behind the time. So our last presenter, Dr. Thandan. Dr. Thandan, please. A very Please good start. afternoon, one and all. Uh, thank you, AIOS, for providing me with this opportunity. Uh, I will be presenting on study of closed globe injuries in a tertiary hospital. Ocular trauma remains an important cause of avoidable and predominantly monocular visual morbidity, that is, visual impairment and blindness. The annual incidence rate of hospitalization for eye injuries per lakh population per year is about five to six percent worldwide. Strategies for prevention of ocular trauma require knowledge of the cause or mechanism of injury, which may enable more appropriate targeting of resources toward preventing such injuries. Uh, the aims and objects of my study are to assess the clinical presentation of closed lobe injuries and to determine the final visual outcome of this injury is after treatment. A prospective longitudinal study was conducted in the Department of Ophthalmology, RIMS, Impal, for a period of 24 months with patients presenting with closed lobe injuries uh, covering all age groups provided they are willing to participate. And all those patients who refuse to participate and those patients with uh, all these mentioned conditions were excluded from my study. A sample size was calculated to be 102. Uh, these, were the uh, these were the study tools used in my study. Snellens visual equity chart, shear stonometer, uh, direct ophthalmoscope, indirect ophthalmoscope, slit lamp biomicroscope, 90D lens, gonioscope. Uh, these are the few instruments I have shown in pictures. So 
So personal information, history digging, general physical examination, local examination, ophthalmologic evaluation, and few radiological investigations were taken as the ind independent variables. And clinical presentation and the final visual outcome after the treatment were taken as the outcome variables. So uh, I proceeded uh, with complete history taking and informed consent. Then visual equity was recorded using Snellen's chart. Local examination, anterior segment examination was done, IOP measured for each patient. Fundus examination was done, gonioscopy was done in some relevant cases. And I followed up the patients at one week interval, two weeks, six weeks, and three months, uh, during which visual equity, IOP, fundoscopy, and slate lamp examination were done. And final visual outcome and complications, if there was any, were evaluated. Statistical analysis was done using IBM SPSS software version 21.0. Ethical approval was obtained from the Research Ethics Board, Regional Institute of Medical Sciences, IMPAL. Uh, so the closed globe injuries was found to be uh, commoners among the age groups 16 to 30 with male preponderance, uh, mainly in the rural areas with uh, the most common site being occupational uh, workplaces. And blunt objects were found to be the most common cause and most of the patients, they reported to the hospital within 24 hours of injury. And subconjunctival hemorrhage was found to be the most common clinical presentation. And most of the patients, uh, they had a, on first presentation, most of the patients, they had a good visual equity. That is about 6 by 6 to 6 by 18. So coming to discussion, out of the total 102 cases, uh, during this 24 months period, the highest incidence was found to be among the age group 16 to 30 years. And uh, with more incidents occurring among the males compared to females. And mostly blunt injury, uh, mostly these closed lobe injuries were common uh, in workplaces. And blunt trauma followed by foreign bodies were the most common causes. And majority of the patients, they were from rural areas. And most of the cases they presented within 24 hours. Subconjunctival hemorrhage was found to be the most common clinical presentation. And at the time of presentation, most of the patients, the visual equity was found to be 6 by 18 or even better. And uh, very less patients uh, had poor visual equity, that is less than 3 by 60. Uh, we have come to these conclusions that. Ocular injuries were more commonly seen in second and third decade of age and more commonly in males compared to females. And these injuries occur more commonly at occupational workplace followed by uh, road traffic accidents with blunt objects as the major cause. Subconjunctival hemorrhage uh, being the most common clinical presentation followed by corneal foreign bodies and abrasions. At three months follow up, most of the cases about, that is about 93.2% of the eyes presented with normal vision. Uh, so take home message goes to prevention is always better than cure. Implementation of appropriate preventive measures at potentially hazardous places is very important. And promotion of safe riding practices with implementation of traffic rules uh, become critical and prompt transfer to good eye care facility and early management are the key factors in preventing visual mortality and special emphasis to be given regarding uh, conducting eye care programs in the rural population. And these are my references. Thank you. What is your aim as you are a resident now? What is your aim to implement your studies in your state in future? Uh, sir, my aim is because your theory and implementation is different. So, but what is your in your mind after passing out that after completion of residency, those you know to fulfillment all those are you mentioned in and in the last slide. Mm. Sir, uh, I would like to uh, spread awareness first yes, regarding all the main causes and uh, most of the causes means uh, like I have seen occupational workplaces 
can even road traffic accidents. And I have mentioned in my slides also, all these are something I could prevent by uh, spreading awareness among the people. And then compared to rural and urban areas, sir, I feel that the awareness programs are very less, means uh, very less in the rural areas. And mainly because of that only the I feel like- Awareness program to the healthcare worker or the public? Who is Both, more sir. effective? More yeah. effective will be among the public, sir. Healthcare worker. Yes. Yes. Okay, fine. Very nice. Good, you, good reply. Okay, we Thank are, we you, are already uh, running behind, so okay. it's very sure. less. Okay. Thank you, sir. Is there or they are there. We, are, we are very fortunate enough. We are uh, just with Shahu, sir. So, so we can conclude now. Yeah. Sir.